Just begin, tell us something of your background, what you became, how you became a Christian. You just flow on and, and I'll, I'll keep you on track if you need. Okay. But you, you yeah. fire away. Okay. Uh, my name's Chrissy and I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Is it? I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, in the late 50s um, to a fair-sized family, uh, a Roman Catholic family, so it was a good size, uh, even by American standards. Um, and my mother's side of the family were Polish-Americans. My dad's side, Irish Americans. So there was a heavy Catholic influence on both sides. But as a family, uh, my dad was outnumbered, so we, we lent more to the Polish tradition of Roman Catholicism in our practices um, as a family. Pittsburgh is a very Catholic city. And even today, you can drive through the streets uh, of some of the suburbs and look on the front lawns of the homes and find home after home has a grotto or a statue to Mary right in front, very prominent, flowers around her, uh, homes are full of statues in the windows, etc. So there was a very huge Catholic presence. And when I was born, which was before Vatican II, the Mass was still in Latin. So I cut my teeth on those Latin syllables and the responsorials and the Mass itself and the centrality of that for us. We were very, very devout. And my mother had studied Catholic theology uh, at college. She was trained by Dominicans. Two of my uncles were Jesuit trained. So it was all there. And I, I knew my dogma as a Roman Catholic. I really knew my dogma. Now, part of the thing in America, as you may know, we have separation between church and state. All right? So what that meant for the people, normal families, is if you wanted to give your children religious education, i.e. put them in a parochial school, a religious school, you have to pay for that yourselves. So the problem for us is, number one, Roman Catholics weren't allowed to practice birth control. All right? Large families. And if my parents, who were good Catholics, wanted us to have a Catholic upbringing, Catholic education, my dad, on the, his single salary, would have had to pay tuition fees on top of his taxes to give us that. And a lot of parents couldn't afford that. So our Catholic indoctrination was supplemented by us having to go on Saturdays to school, which was a really big drag. Um, there was one year where I was actually enrolled into a Catholic school, and that was the most important Catholic year of my life because at the age of seven, I was going to receive two of the seven sacraments uh, that we were allowed to receive as Catholics, and that would have been uh, sacrament of penance, which is being allowed to go to confession every week. And then from that, that comes first, and then you're able to receive the sacrament of the Eucharist. Okay, you can't receive the Eucharist until you're allowed to go to confession because you can't receive the Eucharist with sins on your soul. Right? So those were two really important moments in my young life when I was seven. And I still have the photograph of my first Holy Communion when I was dressed like a little bride. And I was, uh, that thrilling day when I was allowed to actually eat the flesh of Jesus and become his bride. And I believed it with all my heart. Uh, and my family did too. And we were very, very uh, alert to keeping all of the things that were incumbent on us for us to hope that we could get into heaven uh, one day. Certainly uh, minimize our time in purgatory. Okay, but there was, no self, there was no assurance of our salvation. There was none. There was only lots and lots of hope, lots and lots of good deeds, like I say, keeping the sacraments, attending Mass and the High Holy Days regularly, Holy Days of Obligation, 
And for me then, later in my preteen years and early teenage years, I really, really wanted to know that I could like please God uh, and and like I say, hopefully just minimize any sentence I might have racked up for purgatory and I started making novenas. Do you know what novenas are? Yeah. Well, when you um, sort of offer up on a, uh, on a sort of a planned rota a certain number of prayers in a certain way at certain times, like say seven Mondays in a row you go and, and do these masses and say these prayers or light these candles or, or whatever um, you then earn something by the way grace is earned in Catholicism you earn something called an indulgence and that indulgence is like a, a huge whack off of your purgatory sentence and there are occasions through history where people were promised what is called a plenary indulgence which is a totally clean purgatory slate so for example in history in, in trying to get people together to go on the crusades and get those armies together those people were promised a plenary indulgence by the popes if they would come and fight those wars okay when Lech Wałęsa was bringing down communism the way those people got to strike in, in the Solidarity Movement, all those Catholic people in Poland, they were promised plenary indulgences. See how it works. Okay, so that was very much part of my psyche and my belief and good works. Um, I, as part of keeping the, 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 the sacraments, I couldn't get there every week, but I went to confession as often as I could. Because again, even if you didn't have much to confess, the fact that you went meant that you earned more grace. So often, because I, I was a good girl, I didn't, I didn't do a lot of things that were, were wrong. Okay, you fight with your brothers and sisters, whatever. But as often as you're going and you're waiting to go into that tiny little box and confess your sins to the priest, sometimes I think, I, I don't really have much to say. I just went last week, you know, so I would make up sins. <laughs> and then I would tack on to the end, because you bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Da, 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 it's been so many weeks. Well, it was last week since my last confession, and this is what I've done. And then I would always finish those ones by saying, and I've also lied, because I just told them all. <laughs> And then he, then he would give me my penance, you know, say so many Our Father's Hail Mary's glory be, etc. Et give me absolution, and I'd come out, kneel down, say the prayers, and, and say until next week. Okay, so I was really wanting to be godly. I was wanting to be saved. There was a lot of guilt and fear in the system. And even as an, uh, an American citizen, um, back in those days, we all we didn't have assemblies like you had, but every morning, every classroom of children in in every school would stand at the beginning of each day in school, hand on the heart, and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. That's gone now. But even when we used to do that, and I used to do it, but I always knew from tiny little girl that my first allegiance was to the Pope. That if anything were ever to happen, if there was a conflict between my country and the Pope, it was the Pope that got my allegiance. I mean, imagine having, you know, JFK as the president. I mean, it's fantastic for us Catholics, you know, Catholic president. But that was where my allegiance was. And in my particular circumstance, we were very, because of the Polish influence, we worshipped Mary very, very fervently. We did homage to her. Um, you know, it was like very cutthroat who got to be the May Queen, you know, in school because you got the crown, the statue of Mary. Um, she was always depicted uh, as the woman with the 12 stars on her crown, you know, the, very much like the chapter of Revelation 12. So my image 
of the woman in Revelation 12 was always Mary until I was later deprogrammed from that. <laughs> um, and she was the Queen of Heaven. I knew that. Okay, and, until I read the Bible and realized how, how awful worshiping the Queen of Heaven was, I, we thought we were doing the right thing. We were forbidden to read the Bible. Now, I, I was born before Vatican II, okay, in the 60s, 63 to 65, where certain changes were made uh, in the Catholic Church, but they were cosmetic changes. You know, as Keith Green uh, once wrote um, in his tracts, the Catholic Church prides itself on two things. Number one, that Rome has never changed. Number two, Rome is always changing. <laughs> and that's how the religion is. That's how it is. I was able, because of being so indoctrinated um, by the, the apparent discrepancies you know, that, that exist within Rome, that the contradictions are many, uh, I was often told it's a mystery. Don't try to reconcile these things. It's a mystery. You'll never understand it. And so by the time I, I was high school age, I firmly believed in both evolution and creation. Because I was taught one at school and one in the church. And as a Catholic, there was no problem. I could believe both. That's how brain dead I was. And I'll, I'll relate to a, a story just to give you an idea of that. Uh, how I was stopped from thinking. When I was 12 years old, I was getting ready to receive another sacrament, uh, which is the confirmation. And I was getting prepared for receiving the confirmation, which, according to Catholicism, is when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, a refresher course on all the indoctrination, all the Ten Commandments, which in Catholicism are different from the ones in the Bible. I don't know if you know that. Okay? All of that stuff. Refresher course, you're getting ready to stand up as, a, as a, an adult and, as they put it, become a soldier for Christ. And by that time, I mean, I, I prayed the rosary. You know, not many kids my age did stuff like that. Um, and, and the rosary contains um, 450 reps of the prayer Hail Mary, you know, against just a handful of reps of, of the Our Father prayer, which is the scriptural one. I did all that. I knew all the prayers. I knew everything. But one thing that bothered me, and I was determined to ask the priest when he came around to our confirmation class just to see if we were okay, if, there, if anybody had any questions, you know, for Father Marcus. I thought, you know what, I'm going to ask him when he comes. And my question was this. How is it when you say the rosary and you have to say the Hail Mary 450 times to the Blessed Virgin, doesn't she get bored? <laughs> Hearing the same prayer again and again and again. And I really was troubled by it. I was thinking, my goodness, you know, if my kid came to me and did that, well, I thought, you know what, I'm going to ask. Now, the, the chemistry in the classroom didn't make it easy to ask that question because we had a real battle axe of, a, of a, an administrator and she was really tough and it would really upset her that should, there should be any questions when the priest came around. That meant the teacher wasn't doing her job. I thought, no, I'm going to do it. So one day he eventually came. Hello, children. Hello, Father Marcus. How are you today? Fine. Does anybody have any questions you'd like to ask? And then I just... Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was a gasp. <laughs> <laughs> and the administrator who was standing there looked at my teacher. So, and yes, he had no idea of the politics. Yes, and so I stood up and said, Father, I, I'm really bothered about one thing, yeah? And I asked this question. When you say the rosary, doesn't Mary just get bored hearing the same prayer again and again and again? And all of my fellow students went, Yeah! <laughs> Way to go, way to go, yeah, yeah, what about it, you know. And so 
He sensed the rebellion <laughs> in the room, and he knew he had to do something quick. And so he said, well, the thing is, your holy mother loves you so much. She loves you so much. That if, when you come to her, she loves it so much that if you were even to just say the word spaghetti... 450 times. She would just love that because you've come to her. And I felt like a heel. Yes. And, and all the student, you know, I was made to look stupid for even asking. And all the other classmates went, yeah, stupid. You know, and so I never asked another question. I never asked another question after that. I was 12 years old. Went through the confirmation class, got confirmed and then went into high school. It was in high school that I really, in searching for fulfillment, because even being a good Catholic, there was something wrong. And I knew by the time I was 15 that I had hell inside of me. Now, everything on the surface was wonderful. I come from a wonderful family with wonderful parents, who did everything for us kids. I'm the second of six kids. Um, my mom comes from a huge family, and it was, it was lovely, really. Never any real problems or issues, but I was really, I had hell inside of me, and I couldn't touch it or get rid of it. I couldn't, there was nothing I could do. And what happened to me was there was a young Christian girl in one of my classes in high school, and I knew there was something different about her. And one day, I didn't know her very well, um, but one day she offered me a free ticket to see a film. And her church had hired a local movie theater to show a Christian film. And the film itself was a modern-day version of The Prodigal Son. This was in the 70s, um, when a lot of people were still hitchhiking across America to find themselves and all of that. And she, free ticket to see a film? Sure, I'll go. And I rode my bike that night to the, to the theater. And I sat in the theater and I watched this film. And the film was about this young guy... Again, modern-day version of the prodigal son. His dad was a corporate vice president. The guy, they had all the money you could ask for. The guy, he was a rich kid, and he was unfulfilled, and he started hitchhiking across America to find himself. And I, I'm sitting there thinking, this is so dumb. You know, what's your problem? Grow up. you got everything. You know, do something with your life. And he's hitchhiking. End of the story, he, 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 he meets a Christian girl, she missionary dates him and takes him to a Christian meeting where he gets saved. And that's the wonderful ending of the story. But I thought, oh, this, is, this is ludicrous. I, I, I couldn't relate to it. But at the end of the film, there was an altar call given. And I sat there not really comprehending very much at all. But God was working on my heart. And I sat there while they were asking for people to come forward to respond. And I, I was fighting inside. Because there was something there that I knew I wanted. But I didn't understand it because there was, I was so brainwashed in my way. And in, 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 in the, the false religion of, of Catholicism. And I have to say, with all of the uh, wonderful information we're getting on cults here together... To me, Catholicism is the elephant in the living room when it comes to cults. It's the biggest cult going. It's the most deceptive. And it, it, it you know, over a billion people think they're Christians. You know, it's not just a sect. It's not just something obvious. And, and you know, it, it breaks my heart when real born-again Christians don't understand the need for Catholics to get saved and to be discipled out. You know. Anyway, I ended up going forward that night. And I signed a card. I mean, tears were streaming down my face. Um, and they must have thought, oh, we've got to write one tonight. You know? 
I, I went through the little Four Spiritual Laws book and I signed it, gave my address and everything, and I walked out of the theater that night not really understanding very much at all. And I was riding my bicycle home and I was thinking, oh, my mother's going to ask me about this movie. I can't. What am I going to tell her? What am I going to... It's a Protestant movie. Now, you know, again, when, when I was a young Catholic and we used to sing a, a hymn such as... Um, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of create that one, creation. When that would come up, you know, in the Mass, my mom would go, I shouldn't be singing this. It's a Protestant hymn. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Catholic version has the words changed. Now ye who hear, now to his altar draw near. Okay, because of the sacrifice of the Mass. But, they changed it. It wasn't the Protestant, not to his temple, draw near, or whatever it is. So, from a young age, Protestants were like, whoa, what's that? You know, that's something to stay away from and, and, and watch out for. I didn't know what it meant. It's a Protestant hymn. So, I'm coming home with this conflict in my thinking. What, if my mom asked me, you know, what, about, what did I see? What am I going to tell her? So, I prayed, please, God, don't let her ask me. <laughs> so I come home, come in the, you know, put my bike away, go in the front door. Mom, I'm home. Did you like the film, dear? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm going to bed now. Okay, good night. And I got off really easy that time. But the problem then became that I started receiving follow up literature from the organization uh, that um, produced the film. And I thought, oh no. You know, here's this stuff coming, and, and my mom's going to ask me, what's this coming to you? Where, you know. Thankfully, she never did ask me, but the very first thing that came was a Bible study, you know, on, on a sheet of paper this big. And as a Roman Catholic, like I say, the Bible was forbidden until just after Vatican II when they, they lifted the pressure a little bit by saying, okay, you can, you can read your Bible now, but you can't interpret it. That's for the priest. All right? So a lot of Catholics say, well, well I'm not going to bother. Why well, bother? I haven't read it until now. I haven't needed it. So I opened up this Bible study and it said, read John 3.16 and fill in the following questions. I thought, well, what does that mean? I'd never seen a Bible reference in my life. I didn't know what, what John 3, colon 16, what is it? You know? I, thought, and I, I, I puzzled over it for a long time. And then I thought, ah, a phrase came to me, chapter and verse. I'd heard it somewhere, chapter and verse. And I thought, I wonder if that's in the Bible. I'd never opened the Bible in my life. We had one, just like a lot of holy relics, you know, in the house to kind of sanctify it. So I thought, huh, I'll find out. So I waited until my parents were out. I went to the shelf, got the Bible, Catholic Bible, closed up the space on the shelf, took it into my room, <laughs> and I thought, John 3.16, John 3.16. I'll look in the table of contents and see if there's something called John. And I did, and there was four of them. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll start with the first one. And I had no clue about chapters and verse divisions, nothing. So I went through, okay, 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 and the verse matched the questions. I thought, ah, okay, I can do this. Anyway, to cut it a bit short, I filled in the questions, sent it back. Now, back in those days, I didn't have an allowance. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any way to pay for stamps. So I had to ask my mom for a stamp. So my, my next fear was, she's going to ask me, what do you need these stamps for? What, what am I going to tell her? I'm doing this Protestant Bible study. <laughs> she never asked. And I did several of these little Bible studies. They didn't quite go in. But something had stirred in me. There's no doubt about it. What eventually happened by the following year was 
an uncle of mine in the Air Force had gotten saved, for real. Now, this was one of my uncles who'd been trained by Jesuits. He'd gotten saved in the Air Force out west. He came into Pittsburgh and dragged my entire family to a conference that was being held locally. And now, this was in the 70s. The conference was a Catholic charismatic conference. And I will say that in the 70s, God was moving, and it started in Pittsburgh. And the evidence and the fruit of that, which is why I can testify that it was God, was not only were many Catholics, my whole family at that point got saved. My grandparents, my parents, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, I mean, it was... But we weren't unique. We weren't unique. But those Catholics were not only getting saved, they were coming out. They were coming out to, in such droves that the Catholic Church had to do something to stem that flow. And what we have today is the modern Catholic charismatic movement. I watched it change at first hand. There were times when I was able to get up and give testimony in a Catholic charismatic meeting and exhort Catholics not only to give their lives to Jesus, but to come out. How long do you think that lasted? Soon we were seeing members of clergy coming up and reminding people about confession on Saturdays, redefining our terms like being born again, grace, spirit-filled. And the problem that we have today is not only ignorance on the part of true Christians to the nature of the deception, but Catholics who are that much more embedded into thinking that they're born again because of the Catholic charismatic movement. It's not the same animal as when I got saved. Now they are making lots of noises about, you know, worshipping the host even more fully because of being born again. Um, I could go on and on and on, but Catholicism depends on the re-sacrificing of Jesus, the bloodless sacrifice week after week, day after day, in order to hope for some kind of salvation which they never have an assurance of which they can't because it's a false doctrine anyway um, how am I doing? So, you did great <laughs> do, I'll, I'll stop there uh, take questions uh, yeah? yeah? questions anybody? I've got one too 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 yeah yeah every Saturday our oh, catechism is a little book yeah well that's what we I mean you yeah, the, the mortal. Okay, mortal and venial sin. Okay. <laughs> well, there are other people speaking tonight. I will. I will explain about mortal and venial sin. Venial sins are the lesser ones. You can confess those. You know, they're the sort of white sins. Mortal sins are far more serious. Mortal sin, if you die with a mortal sin on your soul, yeah. straight to hell, do not pass go, do not collect 200 bucks. Okay? But there are sins that are worse than mortal and venial. I don't know if you know them. They are the cardinal sins. There are two cardinal sins, which if you commit either one of these, you have had it. You've had it. You are damned. And I'll tell you what they are. There's only two. One is the sin of despair. You despair. You're such a wretched person that even God can't save you. You're so bad and filthy and wretched and wicked. And you despair of your salvation. It's a sin of despair. Even God is not powerful enough to save you. All right? If you commit that sin, all right, the other one is the sin of presumption. How dare you presume God would save you? What do you think you are? God's going to save you? How, you? how dare you presume that? That sums it up. You, it's, it's a lose-lose religion. Yeah. The catechism um, classes were the Saturday classes I mentioned. I didn't use the word catechism, but that's what they were. Uh, well, I you saw something for me because I was brought Catholic. And... Um, it's because when I met, I've, I've only been sick a couple of years, and I ended up going to make a baptism for anybody. And he says, Do you want to put me baptism? And I said, 
mystery tour. I thought, yeah, I used to go on a mystery tour every yeah. Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were forbidden to read the Bible to keep us in darkness. Um, yeah. it, was, it was later when I started to read the Bible that all the conflicts came up between what I had been taught and what I was reading. So much so that not just within me, but within my, my mom in particular, because she had really been this theology buff. My dad was just a lovely Catholic guy. He just did everything, and that was it. But my mom was the intellectual one, and because she used to argue theology with her Jesuit brothers and all of that, she was really heavy-duty. And it was reading the scriptures. And we also had a very, very godly AOG pastor when we got saved, um, this guy, he's quite well known in this country uh, as it happens. He was from Cardiff, a lovely old fellow named Robert Owen. And he, so his church, he was a tiny little AOG church, like they used to be a little wooden thing, but there was so many people getting saved, his church just exploded in numbers. And he used to just come to our house to give us a Bible study because it was easier than all of us going to him. <laughs> And we used to take up quite a few rows in his church on a Sunday night. And that's the other thing. He not only came and discipled us out and patiently explained from the Bible, no, transubstantiation is not biblical. No, we don't worship Mary. No, we don't pray to the saints. No, we don't do these things. He was very specific. And you need to be willing to do that with Catholic people who get saved. Not just... Uh, as, as someone was saying earlier, I can't remember who we talked to so, you know, so many people. Somebody said, oh, well, a Catholic once said to me, you know, well, what's important is the presence of God. Now, we said that ourselves last night. It is important, the presence of God. But when you say that to a Catholic, what does that mean? The real presence? In the wafer? You see? It's, it's doublespeak. But this man was very, very patient and meticulous in explaining to us no, it's not this. He didn't just take it for granted that we understood the positive things and agreed with him. You cannot take those things for granted. And he also took it on himself to, to get us all baptized and so forth. But it took almost a year for us to stop. Because for about a year, because you're so brainwashed, if you, don't, if you don't have the five points of the Mass, if you're not there for all five I points, anymore. Yeah, you just committed a mortal sin. So we were there for all five points of the Mass, every time. And it was still so deep that we would go to Mass Sunday morning and the AOG Sunday night for quite a long time until we were deprogrammed. And the biggest problem for us to get our, our, our minds renewed about was the transubstantiation issue. You know, that, that the, the John chapter 6, eat my flesh, drink my blood, to, to get real clarity on that. Uh, that took a while. But you have to be willing to do that. It's, it's the biggest cult in the world, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm familiar with some of what you say. I've got a friend that's form, former non on But <clears throat> occasionally in my life I've encountered Catholics who I'm pretty sure know the Lord. And that's what I can't understand. Mm. Most recently I've seen some Christian television station, I don't know whether you've seen it, called EWTN. Mm. There's a nun on there. I don't want to give names up, it's not a good idea. I don't know. Anyway, 
I love to hear her speak. She talks about the Lord. Mm-hmm. She, this woman knows the Lord. Mm-hmm. There's also a priest. There's lots of other people that I'm saying you wouldn't listen to. There's a, lot, there's a priest that speaks in the same way. Mm-hmm. I don't understand. I, I look at my think, but you know the Lord. Um, but I don't no. get it. Why? How is it? Do they know the Lord? Good Do question. they know the Lord? Why does it? It upset me the other day to see this wonderful elderly lady. I think you might have her name, Sister Angelica. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she founded that radio station. Yeah. Wonderful. I mean, she. Well, that's what I said. Uh, and but I saw her the other day on the on the sh- uh, station. There was a huge statue of Mary, which was sitting under. That gave me the creeps a bit. But a lot of the time, this woman does know the Lord. And no. Does she? Is it? Well, we don't know. We don't know, but our motive has to be to see them come out. You know, even if a priest gets saved or a nun, especially for a priest, do you know when they are ordained, it is pronounced on them, thou art a priest forever according to Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And that from that point on, they have the power in their fingers to change a whole bakery into the body of Christ if they so wish to do it. And by virtue of, of, of just the, the wearing of that Roman collar, which is a dog collar, it means that they are subservient, they, they are tethered to Rome. Mm-hmm. All right? Um, just by wearing that, in my understanding, which I, you know, they are preaching a different gospel. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what they say, mm-hmm. but just that apparel and, and staying within that system they are preaching a different gospel. So are those nuns. Now, I don't know what it would cost some of these people to leave. You know, I'm not in their position. I mean, it would cost them their livelihood, the roof over their heads, probably everything. They've got to come to a place where they're willing to lay down their lives to that extent and come out. Um, there's a lovely Canadian fella that I've spoken to more than once. He comes over here sometimes. We met him last year. And, you know, he, he, he's just not willing to pay that kind of price. Mm-hmm. But at what cost don't you pay that price? Mm-hmm. There are also people who, I don't know, there are deceivers. And as part of that, that anti-reformation movement in the 70s, you know, the, the, there was a particular order of priesthood, the Jesuit order, that really kicked into action in order to deceive. I mean, that's what their order of priesthood is all about. That's why that order was formed, in order to stop the original Reformation and stem that flow of people leaving. But that's what they do now. They're the only Catholic order that was ever allowed to marry, to wear plain clothes, they would, they would learn. They were the KGB of Rome, in order to do the bidding of the Pope politically, religiously, whatever he required. So when you're dealing with a Jesuit, they are allowed to lie. I don't, I'm not saying they all do. I don't know, but they are allowed to do whatever it takes to do whatever the Pope wants. That's why they were formed as an order. So. I can't judge people's hearts, but I know what my goalposts always have to be. And whether by praying or by ministering to them, by speaking to them, I had a lovely experience just late last year where a Catholic couple came over to me at the end of one of Helen's outreaches, and they really wanted to know. that The woman was a cradle Catholic. She was about to turn 70. Both, both of those people uh, gave their lives to Jesus and within two weeks they were out of Rome. <laughs> and they're in a lovely church and the pastor emails us to let us know how they're growing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Neil. Um, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really burdened by this question of how most evangelicals in Britain seem to be completely oblivious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, me too. And mm-hmm. I find that I have these two dynamics. One is how I, I talk to Catholics who are, they are a very wide spectrum, aren't they? Obviously, yeah. Like, like every like CV, any big movement. You, yeah. know, you get some that are just totally ignorant, nominal, then you get some really devout, yes. sort of Mariolatry. Yeah. You get some that you can talk to them for an hour and they seem to be like completely on the same page with us. Yeah. And then they say something and, or, or, you know, all you think, man, you're a 
Christian, why are you in this church? Yeah. But then I, I find it far less frustrating talking to Catholics than I do to Christians. I agree. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts for us all about the Church Together movement and, you know, the Christians across dot, 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 that you get in all these towns. And I just, I've really struggled as, around as a <coughs> church leader. I went for the leaders of these things. I'm talking about the evangelicals. Yes. They're usually the ones pushing the ecumenical, yeah. which I don't understand. Mm-hmm. And I say to them, look, do you love Catholics? Yes. And they're like, oh yeah, we love Catholics. You're the ones who don't love Catholics. Yeah. Because you don't get involved with our ecumenical meetings. I'm like, it's because I love Catholics that I don't get involved. Mm-hmm. Because you say they're okay. Yeah. But you don't understand that when they use the vocabulary that we use, they don't mean the same thing. Exactly. And they don't want to listen to me. I know. And I say it more nicely than I'm saying it now. <laughs> <laughs> I go to the cup of coffee, I sit down and I talk to yeah. and I try and, you know, and I just, I don't know, what, what's your anger? Is, is there any hope in convincing the mainstream evangelical church that if they have any love for Catholics at all, they've got to clarify you? Yeah. I'm I'm in a very good position, actually, when it comes to that, because I I do speak to a lot of church leaders. Uh, in the course of a year um, because I organize Helen's Outreach Calendar and Mana Music does not endorse the Church's Together movement as a whole. Now, a lot of pastors will ring us up uh, and ask to use one of Helen's Outreaches as a launch for either Alpha or as a Church's Together event. And I do quiz them about it anyway because for clarity, if it's to launch Alpha, we won't do that, specifically. Um, and if they say, well, it's churches together in our area, and I, I'll, I'll say, well, can you tell me who the churches are? And if they don't say Roman Catholicism, then I ask, what about the Roman Catholics? And then I take their answer, okay? Depending on their answer, I deal with it one way or the other. If they do list Rome, then I say, well, um, because of the true gospel message, and I don't tell them I'm an ex-Catholic until further down the line, (laughs) much further. Uh, I have been hollered at. I've had the phone slammed down on me. Uh, It's rare, but it has happened. Um, I do speak to the person and try to appeal to them. First of all, do they understand the Gospel of Rome? Do they understand the doctrines and dogmas? Do they understand, you know, how uh, so, salvation according to Rome? And then I explain how, while we invite and welcome Roman Catholics to come to these meetings, if they were organized with the help of Roman Catholics, we can't. We can't compromise like that. We can't mix the message. Sometimes they accept it. Sometimes they want to say more. Sometimes we get invited by Catholics. And that's a tricky one. Because they're like, oh yeah, we want you know, to have this happen. We know that... Um, well, and I have to witness then to that person. You know, a Catholic person. So, I have actually been pushed to the point where I have said, you know, if... If you continue in, in your thinking in this way and you're not prepared to preach the gospel to Catholics, then their blood is on your hands. Mm-hmm. You know, you're letting them think they're saved. And, that, and I've had to say it as strongly as that mm-hmm. in order to get through. Um, then I tell them I'm an ex-Catholic. Mm-hmm. Because I try to go through the doctrines for them to give them an idea of what they're really dealing with. A lot of them are just ignorant. Mm-hmm. Just ignorant and they think, oh, we've given them bad press we want to, to kind of make friends. Um, so, yeah, you have to talk your way through and see where people are coming from. But I do get to do that. Um, but I'm afraid with, unfortunately, the Alpha courses, um, the, the widest acceptance of those courses is through the Catholic churches. You know, that's just the way it is. And so a lot of churches think that's great. Um, but I can't, I can't endorse that. The Catholics think Alpha is fantastic. What, you, what is it about Alpha that means it's so powerful to Catholics? Um, it's not exclusive enough. Mm-hmm. It's not exclusive. And don't forget, too, in order to minister to a Catholic, you have to not only tell them the positive doctrines of the gospel, you have to say, and that means 
you cannot believe this. Alpha doesn't do that. It's, it's broad enough, um, and, and not just Catholics find it broad enough and acceptable enough. Loads of people do, but specifically Catholics. They see it as another renewal movement. That's right, there is. That's right. There's a whole Catholic office devoted to, to Alpha. So they've, and I've sent away for some of the literature Alpha for Catholics, and it's just Catholic literature. It's not Alpha literature. It's Catholic literature. That scares me. You know, and I know that um, at one point there was a, a leaders meeting, cardinals, bishops, Catholic, you know, assembled for um, a training course or an or, um, introductory course about Alpha, and it was being presented by Nikki Gumbel, Sandy Miller, and one of the bishops did have a question. Well, you've said all this about Alpha and this, 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 but you've left out Mary. You know, where does she fit in? And Sandy Miller didn't know what to say. And a cardinal stood up and said, can I answer that? And he turned to the bishop and he said, don't worry, we'll put her in later. Yeah, so that's what you're battling. It's a spirit. It's a spirit of compromise. And there's a couple I'm in contact with. And they know all that's strong with them, or I know a lot that's strong with them, and one of them had a, an encounter with Jesus. Mm. And they come to my own group, mm. and yet still going to the Roman Catholic Church. How can I best help them? If your goalpost's in the right place, that eventually you want to see them come out. Whenever, whatever you're studying in your Bible study, mm-hmm. if it's of the fundamental doctrines of salvation, try to get them to share what their understanding is right. and why they continue in Rome what do they think they're getting out of it try to kind of winkle them out a little bit and see if you can minister to them more specifically okay. yeah but you have to be willing to do that yeah anyway Chrissy thank you so much